Hey crew, I've got the key to that 22 Land Rover Defender 90 V8. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first let's check it out what looks on the inside and outside. This Carpathian Edition has a few exterior extras over the standard V8, like a blacked out hood, a blacked out tailgate, and this matte gray paint job. These faux hood steps are in honor of the original Defender's metal ones. These are just for looks though. There are standard LED headlights and daytime running lights. The Defender badge has a 3D effect to it. This is functional cooling down here, including these added ducts on the V8 model to cool the front brakes and tires. In profile, all V8s get a set of 22 inch dark gray painted alloy wheels wrapped in Continental Cross Contact 275 section front and rear tires. We see those blue painted Brembo six piston brakes popping out at us. There's a V8 badge on the lower sill, blacked out mirror caps and roof on every Defender V8. Stepping back to look at the profile, the 90 name no longer stands for the wheelbase. The wheelbase is actually 102 inches, but I think the short overhangs and the height and the two-door look is more appropriate than the 110 V8 for this truck's sporty character. I love that belt line too, so straight across from nose to tail. And then at the back, it's just lobbed off. That 22 inch wheel does look kind of large, almost too large, hanging off the tailgate. There are LED tail lights here and some companions there. The V8 gets this quad exhaust system for some visual muscle. All in all, the exterior of the Defender V8, especially the 90, has this Bond villain vibe to it. And I'm all for it. Let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside, at this blacked out cabin, V8 models get suede seat inserts, textile borders, and then leather wrapping over the side of them and on the headrests. These seats are power adjustable, heated and cooled. To get to the back seats, you pull on this lever and that by itself won't send the seat forward. You have to hit this button and then uh, just make yourself a snack or something because it's going to take a while. Almost there. There we go. Now we've got a pretty good opening to get to the back seats, but there's nothing to grab onto. Yes, there's a grab handle here, but it's a weird across the body hold. I just end up using the back of the seat to push myself forward. And now behind my own seat at six feet tall, this seat having been paralleled to my driving position, I've got good knee room. The foot pockets are kind of tight though. The headroom is not. Plenty of it. And you gotta love your safari windows and standard panoramic glass roof that does open to bring in lots of light. You get a USB port on the back of each seat, cup holders down there with inserts, a standard three zone climate control system with DC outlets on either side, two USB-C ports. If you don't have someone in the middle seat, this pulls down to give you two more cup holders and a padded armrest. The digs are not bad, certainly for a two door. Let's check out the front. Almost there. The front doors have a leatherette padded here and here, a textured insert around this cool bolt pattern, one touch up down windows, power adjusting door mirrors, two position memory for the seats, a Meridian 700 watt sound system, harder plastics down low, all weather rubberized floor mats, V8 tread plates, and aluminum pedals. Let's go look inside the trunk. Inside, behind the rear seats, we find 16 cubic feet of space. You've got this easily foldable fabric cover, an air suspension adjustment if you want to lower it for easier loading of cargo, a DC outlet there, and an AC outlet here. Now, unlike the 110, the rear seat bottoms in the 90 don't come up, so you can't fold the seats all the way flat, but it's still a huge cargo area. To get up and in, you've got an integrated grab handle here within this magnesium structural bar on the dashboard. Doors close with a very nice thud. There's a 12.3 inch digital gauge cluster that is reconfigurable, a head up display, and as standard you get a 10 inch touchscreen infotainment, but this one has the upgraded 11.4 inch curved glass display. It's running the Pivi Pro software system with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The screen crispness and the graphics are super sharp. Every so often if you select something, there will be a little delay loading it on the screen. Otherwise it's great two zone climate control system here, reconfigurable dials, 
for your drive modes, and then your fan speed, you got a physical volume knob, two USB ports, one A1C, a DC outlet, some storage underneath this part of the console, two cup holders, wireless smartphone charging pad, and here is a refrigerated compartment as standard on this edition, and then the lid goes all the way back to make a shelf for your rear passengers. Grab handles on the passenger side, defender spelled out there, USB-C port, a rubberized storage, storage bin here. There is a suede wrapped steering wheel on the V8 model, and then these big paddles are made of aluminum and feel awesome. Visibility, well, you got a digital rear view mirror to cut through any clutter inside the cabin, and giant rear windows to help you just see with your own eyes, plus standard blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic. I think this cabin is a great mix of well thought out utility with premium details. Is it worth $100,000 though? That we're going to find out in the drive. All right, let's fire it up. A little shimmy in the chassis, a little theater on the startup. That's not a truly cold start because I did drive the Defender here, but it still makes a nice noise. All right, so we are going to be starting out in normal drive mode. I hit that and make sure, sorry, comfort drive mode. There is no normal in the Defender V8. And when you back it up, there is a high resolution camera with trajectory lines. Digital rear view mirror on. And as per usual, we'll do our turning radius test from here. See that? Through the hood. Thank that short wheelbase for a tidy turnaround. As soon as we get out of here, we can do a horn test, like now. Quite civilized. Let's talk about this powertrain. Five liter supercharged V8. It makes 518 horsepower and 461 pound-feet of torque. It's connected to an 8-speed automatic gearbox and sends power to all four wheels permanently, though there is a 2-speed transfer case with a low-range set of gears that we'll take a look at a bit later. Now, you might think 518 horsepower, boy, that's a lot, but it's not as much as this engine in different JLR applications. So is there, there's the F-Pace SVR that makes 550 horsepower, and then there's the Range Rover SVR that makes 575 horsepower. Furthermore, not only, not only does this engine not make as much power here, it also sounds different. So first of all, from within the cabin, you don't hear that guttural V8 quite as much. Now I am pleased to see and feel that the ride quality of this Defender V8 is notably better than the 110 I was just driving maybe two months ago because that one didn't have the adaptive dampers and this one the adaptive dampers are standard and they're able to work through the firmer bumps that come up into the tires and even though we're on lower profile tires here than we were on those all terrains on the 110 it's still a better ride quality now, while the bumps are smoother, what remains from my impressions the last time I drove the Defender is that you can hear the road imperfections and the chassis stays kind of bouncy over the undulations. I suppose that makes it kind of fun, but not quite as luxury oriented as you would picture a Land Rover product. I will say, I do like the tuning of this brake pedal. It's so easy to just coast up to a stoplight and come to a halt without it being any sort of abrupt. 
The throttle response, though, that takes some getting used to. Because you would equate comfort drive mode with smoothness throughout, but what I find is that unless you're so, so careful with the throttle, you either end up not giving enough and you find a deadness in the responsiveness, or you just barely give too much and then you get like a surge of performance. I've actually found that, of all things, eco mode is how you drive the Defender V8 as gracefully as possible because it kind of kills that throttle response, but knowing that, you can give it more without that kind of shocking surge. And then dynamic, is a very perky throttle. Speaking of perky, let's see how quick the 90 V8 gets to 60. In preparation for our quick little bit of exercise, I'm gonna move the selector over into sport. I'll then just, why not, turn off traction control. And you can't actually brake boost it, so I'm just gonna put my foot down. Ho, ho, ho! 4.82 seconds. The nose got so light, I literally thought we were about to take off. Wow! Uh, stepping back for a sec, the reason I couldn't brake boost it is because when you push the brake hard enough, it activates the auto hold feature, so the quickest launch I've seen is literally just doing that, just putting your foot down from sport and in dynamic. It feels so unnatural to go that quickly when you're this high off the ground. A natural sounds good here. Yeah, again, it doesn't sound quite as violent as the SVRs from JLR, but it still sounds really good. And this thing goes like stink, man. You put your foot in it and just hold on. I really want to exercise this transmission, so I'm leaving it in the sport manual, just pulling a paddle to activate the manual operation. The downshifts are quick. Upshifts are rifle quick as well. The sauciness from this engine is beautiful. Really impressed with this eight speed. What an entertaining SUV. Let's cool it off now though. Into drive, and we'll move the drive mode over to eco, so we can hear how it sounds coasting on the highway. Well, I mean, predictably, this unaerodynamic shape doesn't gel well with the wind, so you're hearing a lot of that wind noise. We do have some nice conveniences, like adaptive cruise control, and a lane keep assist system. I can demonstrate for you if I just deviate slightly from the lane, it will correct me back. It doesn't center the wheel, but this is really a handy feature, especially for those who commute or plan on taking this on a road trip. I'm gonna say the 90 V8 is still a, an amenable daily driver. It still has enough comforts. These seats feel pretty good. They hold me in place, but they're not tight. And the cabin insulation is acceptable, right? This is not, you got to come in with the right expectations. It's not a $100,000 just pure luxury vehicle here. And you need to understand that it is going to consume fuel. 15 city, 19 highway, 16 combined. You'll, you'll go through that tank quickly. But is it still a Land Rover? And by which I mean, when you take it off the pavement, does it still deliver the goods? Let's find out. All right, the pavement is done. And we're gonna start out with some of the more technical goodies. So first of all, into neutral, press the low range to activate the low range set of gears. And then I'm also going to select the rock crawl drive mode. And in so doing, it raises up the air suspension to the maximum 11 and a half inches of ground clearance. We can see here that the center and rear locking differential remain unlocked 
but they do that, they lock up automatically when the truck detects slip. You could manually lock up the center and rear by going into the configurable terrain response. There are more settings when you do that as well, like the powertrain response, the steering feel, traction control, and ride comfort. But for now, we're going to do rock crawl. Then into drive, and I'm going to bring up the camera system so we can see the wheel shots and a ground level forward facing view. In the head up display, I've got a projection of the front tire angles and the axis tilt. If I wanted to, I could also hit this button and bring up the all-terrain progress control, which is effectively off-road adaptive cruise. And this works both uphill and downhill where you can set your speed, take your foot off the throttle and brake and just let the Defender do its thing. We can, of course, look through the hood as well. And with those trajectory lines and just seeing right through into your tires, it makes the job of off-roading so much easier. Now for this part here, I'm going to turn off progress control and do it myself. And with the 90s superb approach, departure, and breakover angles, you just have this confidence that the short wheelbase isn't going to get hung up, the front and rears aren't going to get hung up, and you can just go have tons of fun off-road. I didn't even air down the tires, it just, all the systems work so well. And then if I want to use it again, I've got hill descent control. Foot off the brake. and ease on down. And though I haven't really needed it so far, having the extra power with the supercharged V8 would mean that in stickier situations, you can probably dislodge yourself far easier than even the 395 horsepower inline six version of the Defender. All right, suffice to say, the technical stuff, we got it covered in the Defender 90. V8. Now before we conclude, we should just see if we can whip it good. We can whip it. Do 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 do. We can whip it. Do do do. We can whip it. Slow on down. And whip it good. Now, more seriously, and at a more modest pace, here in comfort mode. I did not air down the tires, and I did that for two reasons. One, laziness, and two, because Land Rover, kind of their philosophy of go anywhere in comfort, I don't know, about having to get out on a fire road and air down all your tires, that, that seems sort of at odds with that. So I just kept them where they are, and the ride is fantastic. There is quite a bit of panel squeaking going on, which is not so luxurious. But the suspension really doesn't mind little and large bumps. You know, you feel what's going on. But the ride remains, by and large, comfortable. Steering, too, is way, way better then the, the Defender 110, and, and yes, they added more weight to the steering in dynamic drive program, but they also just tuned this rack differently, and so you have a greater sense of communication. It's easier to place this SUV 
on these roads, it just also makes it more fun. All right, I'm satisfied that the Defender 90 V8 is competent on and off-road. But we need to talk about pricing and competition. The starting figure for the 22 Defender 90 V8 is $104,000. If you want the 110, the four-door, it's $107,000. This Carpathian Edition as tested is $111,000. Those figures are big steps up over the rest of the Defender range. If you want to just get in the door, it's $50,000 for the turbocharged four-cylinder version, makes 296 horsepower. If you want the 395 horsepower in line six, you jump up to about like 64,000. That means that if you need the V8, it's 40 grand more than the already potent inline six. How does it stack up against rivals though? And, and this is a very interesting niche of off-road vehicles. V8 powered, performance oriented. And then this one being kind of luxury bent, it's really peculiar. There are two that come to mind. And I would also consider the Bronco Raptor, but that one, A, I haven't driven it, and B, it doesn't have a V8. So it's a little, little different. The Wrangler 392, $75,000, quite a bit less than this. It isn't offered in two-door, if you want the 392 and the, the Hemi V8 powertrain. It makes 470 horsepower, a little less than this. The 0 to 60 is quicker though, four seconds flat. Fuel economy is worse at 14 combined. Then if you're thinking, all right, I wanna stay within the luxury segment, then you've got the Mercedes-Benz G550. Also, of course, not offered in a two-door. It makes a little over 400 horsepower. It gets to 60 in the slowest, 5.1 seconds. The fuel economy is tied with the Wrangler 392 at 14 combined. But significantly, it's $134,000. So it's a, a, another giant leap over the Defender whether 90 or 110 body style. That makes this vehicle pretty interesting. One, it's the only two-door VA-powered off-road oriented vehicle you can buy. But two, slotting in there, but having like that luxury orientation means that, okay, if you're gonna take a clean version of this and a clean version of 392 to a really nice restaurant, we know which one the valet is gonna park out front. And so it's kind of on par with that G-Class, but a lot less expensive and with the air suspension, I would argue more capable off-road. It's kind of compelling in its uniqueness. And I mean, yes, if you're a Bond villain and you've got a Bond villain budget from all your shady businesses or what have you, then this is your pick. For my money, I'd probably go get the Wrangler 392, but I don't care about classy, that's just me. I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV driver view. If you did, please like, comment, and share the video. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell to get notified. And I'll see you next time.